Kai Patterson and in today's episode of The Fintech Show, we look at how banks can be the best in class when it comes to the newest technologies to compete with the tech companies that, let's face it, are slowly looking to move into finance. AI is a buzzword that banks use all too often, but is the tech just too intricate for them now? Joining me today, we have Haytham and Roland from SmartStream Technologies who bring us Air 2.0. They're a recognized leader in financial transaction management solutions that enable firms to improve operational control as well as reduce costs. One of our fintech finance regulars, Mehdi from DBS, calls in from Hong Kong to lend his expertise when it comes to the world's digital bank using AI. And to complete our globe trotting adventure, we asked BNY Mellon's June to dial in from New York to see how the trade finance sector is looking at these technologies. I think it's safe to say that COVID-19 has disrupted the supply chains uh, somewhat. W what does this mean for for trade finance on a, on a global scale? Yeah, so I think the, how we look at it is uh, obviously, uh, you may be aware, trade finance is one area where it's a very still paper intensive business. So in order for a transaction to be completed between the two parties. They require origination, original documents, and etc. So it is classified as a somewhat of a very manual intensive process. But as a result of the pandemic, where everybody is working from home and unable to retrieve and, and send and pick up these original documents for transacting businesses, uh, it created a huge challenge, right? So the the main street look that I look for is the importance of uh, BCP, business continuity, that people really need to do not take it this for granted that you have a business continuity plan in case of a, such an event, do, similar events uh, do occur. Uh, and then the second point you made, I think the disruption of the supply chain uh, is telling us that maybe perhaps one party or one country is depending on the other countries to create that uh, a supply chain. So therefore, the, the, once there is a breakdown of that, if there is a disruption, uh, it becomes very difficult to create the transactions uh, to be completed. So that's why I think there is more emphasis uh, creating a more of a supply chain landscape within the domestic side. So I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't necessarily call it a nationalism, but it would be called a more of a, you have a contingent plans out there that if the supplier disruption takes place in another corridor, you have an alternative supply chain uh, options that exist uh, within the same country. So I think there is going to be a lot of new look. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's part of the reason as to why people are really focusing intensely in terms of how we can create more of an operational efficiencies uh, going forward. Okay? One of the um, areas that I found quite interesting for, for, for these sorts of technologies is around around reconciliation because you're you're no longer just teaching um an ai how to do it the way that a human has been doing it you're almost giving them kind of a green what's the expression a green a green fields environment to figure out the most efficient way what's um what are your thoughts around this and what's the effect internally on the bank credit willingness is one of the most accurate example uh, that we have with AI right now. And, and there is a different me methods to do it. Um, for example, um, um, the AI will collect data from many prints and they will do the analysis here. And they will elaborate certain models of credit willingness and give an, uh, it, it would give us a, a really accurate model and uh, estimate about a client capable to pay back the money that they need and they borrow from the bank. Uh, but how we can do it? You can do it by the basic uh, infrastructure that you have and basic services that we use for a couple of years. But one of the cool examples that we can uh, can see now on the market, it's uh, if you can collect the data of your phone and just one ton of data, it's the level of battery that you have. And and from the data, what we can understand is that people are like charging their phone regularly and have a high level of battery on their phone are more willing to pay back the money they borrow to the bank than the people they are always on the low level of battery. 
Um, so um, it's it's really it's really funny to see that, and and the behavior is kind of uh, uh, interesting. So the data here is suggesting that the two person are doing it. We don't say that it's a general thing, but uh, from the data perspective, it's kind of interesting to see that. There is another example I can share with you. It's more a fun fact. Um, do you know, like do you know that now we can predict that more than 90 percent uh, your gender based on your on your phone so if you put your phone on your pocket on the bag you will have a kind of a movement signature movement with very different and most of the times the data will say that a man put their phone on their pocket right and women put their phone on their on their bags but by understanding the movement when you walk that the phone can uh, record we can say what kind of gender you are Obviously, you have differentiated markets, yeah, um, and so a lot of it does also depend on legislation within countries and regulations. So typically, in the emerging markets, that's a bit more difficult. The adaptation of cloud and managed services, though, especially in the developed markets, Europe, America, Asia, Pac, has been huge. Um, and I think this has come out of multiple reasons. Obviously, COVID-19 has shown up weaknesses in existing products because they just weren't built or designed to be used from home, not within a environment or a controlled environment of a bank. And people have caught on to the fact that that's, you know, no longer, how could you say, a modern concept. The other thing is, you know, it's becoming more and more clear that from a security aspect, moving to a cloud provided software or a big cloud provider is actually more secure than anything you could do in your own service center, simply because of the investment that's also made into those environments. So the adaptation of that, I think we've seen a, a general uptake in that. Well, what are the opportunities in the future with Air 2.0 when it comes to scaling up? i.e. if you're doing a million tra a million reconciliations every hour um, but then in a year's time you need to do 20 million what are the what are the what's the opportunity and scope there i mean th that's definitely the beauty of a cloud native uh, platform like like uh, air uh, air was built from scratch on cloud technologies and it's able to expand to multiple and multiple times, hundreds of times, the existing volumes for, of some institutions. And it, uh, we, we've seen instances that's just during the, this pandemic uh, where institutions reported 10 times growth in, in volumes. And this is, in, uh, I, I say, in the last six, seven months, totally unplanned for, uh, we were there, ready there. And, and definitely uh, a cloud infrastructure allows a much, much faster uh, expansion of uh, adopting to the, those greater volumes as opposed to a, to a physical infrastructure. It's w during lockdown days, it was quite difficult and, and still is in different uh, geographies to actually have physical expansion of the hardware. The beauty of AI and the, the way we're rolling it out is it, it really requires minimal intervention from the technology uh, gurus at uh, financial institutions. It's self, really self-evident. It's like downloading an app on your mobile phone, clicking it, running it, uploading the files. And it's, it's self-explanatory. Uh, I'd say practically it did proof, if, if that's a correct, politically correct, correct. correct. Uh, for us, if uh, any client wants to come on the our AI platform, it, it's literally a subscription, just uh, drop us a, a line, we enable your uh, ac enable access to our uh, cloud platform and uh, through whether it's Amazon or uh, Microsoft Azure, and we're looking at other platforms. And it's as simple as that, they can hit the ground running within less than a day. I think with um with a lot of these kind of automation tools uh, and, and AI, it seems that we've kind of passed the point where it's now cheaper to use the technology like the kind of the research costs are almost covered than it is just to outsource everything and throw wave after wave of people at it 
what what's this going to to mean for the back for well what's this going to mean for jobs in terms of the opportunities for for relearning and reskilling re there's a couple of things i can say here um basically ai can help to scale some services but everything is not scalable this is a big world on the fintech but also on the startup world scalability but for example if you're a lawyer you cannot scale your time you cannot scale your expertise but you can just wear in an efficient manner that your behavior become really uh, clear and you don't lose time on some requests, right? You can just always be better on how you manage your time. So by using the best tool and train the teams, you can definitely understand what is the pattern of a model because the model can be com complicated. And one of the things that banks need to do, but not also banks, but on every industry, but as we are discussing about FinTech here, um, it's to understand the model. So what is the outcome of the model? Can everyone explain it? For example, at DBS, we do a lot of trainings to understand how to collect the data, how to understand the data, how to structure it on a basic way, but also how you can understand the outcome. And most of the time, if the outcome is complicated, for example, if uh, the, the robot will say, you need to sell uh, those kind of sneakers to that customer. Why? Can you explain it? No, but the data scientists in your company can explain it because they will understand the internal uh, neural uh, architecture of the model. And they will say, okay, based on this data collection here and all those points that we did the analysis here, we can understand why the computer came to you and say you need to sell more sneakers. For example, if that's Nike or Adidas, basically based on the data they collect. So it's something we need still to train. And, and it's a, a new um, a new tool that we try, a new skill set that we try to give to our employees, but also to the future ones that will come to the company later on. Looking at uh, AI and machine learning, uh, especially if you take the likes of Amazon where their AI flywheel just gets faster and faster, where can this be applied to banking within, within trade finance? And what, and what does this mean for wholesale customers? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. So depending on the client's uh, core objective, you can have different variations, right? So. On the finance side, the data analytics is going to be close to much more close to, to the optimization of the working capital, right? So if uh, a particular corporate or clients are paying out later than when they receive funds, they're optimizing their working capital. But one of the things that many banks are trying to do is understand the balance sheet perspective of the corporates to see how they can improve the working capital. On the processing side, it's really about uh, uh, looking at their transactions. So if there are certain, I'll give you one example. If they're certain, paying certain fees uh, and they've been paying those fees uh, and they think that's the fees that the, the, you know they ought to pay, but yet at the same time, another bank may be looking at the analytics and to say, if you think about it, if you just fix one of these things based on the analytics, you're making an error on a one particular common area. And if you were to fix that, uh, you no longer have to pay these fees, right? Because it's, you know, you're going into a straight through uh, a format on the trade side. So once a bank is able to create the analytics and provide that value proposition to a client, they pay less to a bank, yet at the same time, this bank is telling us to improve this. So there is a mutual benefit to both parties. And, and that becomes really where the corporates and the banks will depend on the advisory of the analytics uh, so that can create a positive experience on both sides, uh, which ultimately means better efficiency, uh, a better cost structure. And, and that's really the journey I think that we're all trying to take. Right? So with you guys at BNY Mellon, it would just increase your bottom line. And every time that the analytics is run, it will just get more and more efficient. Correct. So then it allows us to have a better engagement with the clients. And when you do, rather than I say a product sell or a sales pitch, uh, you go into this type of a solution structuring type of a discussion. 
Uh, you can get into a more of a strategic discussion as to what the solutions that the clients are looking for. And this is where I think the data analytics, the data digitization becomes really, really critical. Most of the financial institutions I know of have, have skills shortages, right? And uh, as I said, these are relatively mundane tasks. People are easily being skilled up to, to take more meaningful and strategic contributions with institutions. Uh, I think in very few instances, it, it, it led to an ultimate dismissal of people more than it's more towards uh, reskilling and reutilizing because there is significant shortage across the board. I mean, uh, uh, especially for these operational roles, whether it's us, our competitors, financial institutions, our clients, everybody is looking for, for people, right? And everybody wants me to put people to a more strategic use. Plus, it's it's a generational gap. Yeah, people need, uh, I I think, people need more meaningful meaningful contribution to businesses. Uh, accepting mundane roles is is becoming less and less attractive, uh, especially to newer generations. Right. Absolutely. I don't think I have ever seen a Kubernetes engineer struggling to find work at the moment. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. There, there, there are always there are always opportunities. And I, I think this sometimes this is giving uh, the incentive for people to upskill. A lot of times the financial institutions themselves are have proper programs to transition people and upgrade them. And most of the tier one institutions definitely have such programs. Uh, I, I, I've run into very little instances where people are being let go. Well, that's all we've got time for on today's episode of The Fintech Show. It's been really interesting hearing about how banks are adapting to this significant change in technology, especially as this AI flywheel spins faster and faster. And it's especially nice hearing as well about actual products that are true AI having an impact. And I have a big thank you to Mehdi, Roland, Haytham, June, and of course you, the viewers at home. See you next time. Goodbye.